Well, this is James Gilliard. Welcome to In Black and White. Um, another episode today. And today we're going to talk public education, particularly in North Carolina. I am thrilled to have in studios with me, I think, one of the greatest minds we have right now. Um, in public education in North Carolina, and that is in the person of Maurice Mo Green. Mo, welcome. Thank you. It is my pleasure to be here this morning. Man, I'm so glad you're with us. I want to jump right into it. Um, your, 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 your background is impressive. Thank you. Um, but I want to know, so, so introduce yourself to the people. I mean, I know you. I've read up on you. You're running for superintendent of our North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. But tell us who you are and tell us why you're running. Yes, sir. So I'll start with a little bit of a professional background. I also want to lift up uh, family and then why I'm running. So professionally, um, after completing law school, um, I did a clerkship and then went for a law f- went to a law firm. And then ultimately, that law firm was actually representing the Charlotte Mecklenburg Board of Education. Mm. Um, and I ultimately became one of the lawyers that represented them and then became the lawyer uh, as general counsel for Charlotte Mecklenburg uh, Board of Education. From there, I uh, became the deputy superintendent for Charlotte Mecklenburg Board. And then from there, was blessed and honored to become the superintendent of Guilford County Schools, which is the, sec- the third largest uh, school district in the state. Um, was there for seven years, and we tried to make some tremendous difference there. Um, We utilized a quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. to structure the way we worked, and it was called Intelligence Plus Character. That's the goal of true education. Nice. Uh, From there, uh, left in 2016 to become the executive director for the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation, which is a foundation that focuses solely on North Carolina, but all of North Carolina, Mm -hmm. and provides significant funding for um, public education. So that's a little bit about professional. Yep. And then a little bit about personal, I was able to meet and marry my beautiful wife, Stephanie, uh, at Duke University. Um, We have two adult children. Uh, My son is 23 and my daughter is 27. I'm so proud of both of them uh, as well. They are also public school graduates uh, as well. That's good stuff. So why are you running? So why am I running? I am at a place where I believe that the North Carolina public school system is being dismantled brick by precious brick. Mm. In so many ways um, and in so many instances, the thing that probably got me to the place of saying, maybe I need to lend my voice in a different way, is um, it was a bill at the time that Mm. became legislation to expand Um, a private school voucher program. This is a program where uh, dollars, public dollars, that are so desperately needed in public education um, are going to private schools. Oftentimes, it will be now going for folk who already have made their wonderful choice to send their child to private school can afford to do it. Right. Meanwhile, we have students uh, in our public school system that desperately need that money. And I said, yeah, if we're not careful, we're not going to have, we'll always have a public school system. Right. There'll be something. Right. But it won't be good. Yeah. And I can't sit on the sidelines and let that happen. Well, let me thank you for not sitting on the sideline, first yes, of all. Um, as you know, I ran, uh, have run several times. I've served a several term, couple terms in the North Carolina General Assembly. I always sat on K-12 um, and usually community college and four-year college um, committees because of my passion for education. Really appreciative that you're running. I'm, I'm grateful that a person that's qualified to run is running. Thank you. I don't mean that in an, a derogatory way about other people that are running, but oftentimes— we don't oftentimes have people that are most qualified running in office. And because it is such a sacrifice for family, our time, all of that, um, we share um, um, something in the sense that my wife is also a Duke alum. That's right. And so I didn't meet her at Duke, but (laughs) um, but she's also um, a double Dukey. She did her undergrad. She's actually an engineer and did her engineering program, then her MBA um, there. And so I'm glad to have you. I want to, and I... I share your concern on opportunity, what they call opportunity scholarships. You know, mm-hmm. 
it's always made to sound very attractive, mm. right? But the reality of it is when you dig into the weeds of the bill, you're like, this is such bad news. Mm -hmm. um, and the most recent session where they just moved limitations on income. So mm -hmm. now you have people who could pay for it anyway, you know, getting tax dollars and then the lack of accountability. Right. I, I don't like the terminology, Mo. And the reason I don't is because people call it school choice, right? Mm -hmm. And the struggle I have with that is that when you look at setting up two systems parallel to one another. Mm -hmm. One system, you're giving every tool to succeed. That's right. Funding, flexibility. That's right. I mean, you know this from being a former superintendent. I was shocked when I got to the General Assembly how much fight went into school calendar flexibility. Mm -hmm. Like, I was amazed <laughs> that the coast or the mountains mm -hmm. really dictated the lack of school. So, like, Nash County couldn't get a school calendar flexibility because— the mountains or the coast wanted to make sure students were there at a certain time to be able to work those businesses. That's and true. it was yeah. mind boggling to me, like yes. how landlocked it was. Yes. And so my struggle is we set up these parallel systems. Mm -hmm. One is our traditional K-12 system where we don't get flexibility, where we don't fund properly, where we don't provide proper support services and systems. The other is we say, hey, be as flexible as you want. Kind of do your own thing. We won't even hold you. We we won't even hold you accountable. And then we call it choice. So if I'm a single mom, I'm trying to do. The, I want my child to have the opportunity I didn't have. And here's one school over here that I may be able to get them in, and it's going to be some extra scholarship dollars attached. And they've got a fully staffed teacher pool. And here's my local elementary school yeah. that you know doesn't have all those things. That's right. If I'm that mom really hoping for a shot for my child, That's right. she doesn't have a choice. That's right. She, we're kind of pushing her in a certain direction. That's right. Um, and that concerns me. I think it is a, I think, Mo, I'd love to get your perspective on this. It feels like we are segregating schools all over mm, again. Mm. Yeah, so I think you've got a lot in there. And um, I certainly think that what will ultimately happen if we're not careful, is in fact just that. Um, I want to speak about the funding for a moment. Yeah. I want to speak a little bit about um, the public schools, um, the funding. So as I shared in my professional background, you know, Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools, Guilford County Schools, Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation. I've been with a case called the Leandro litigation <laughs> for 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. I was a lawyer in Charlotte Mecklenburg schools when the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools were saying, look, uh, we need additional funds as well um, because there are many um, dis uh, economically disadvantaged students who are in our school districts as well, the largest school districts. You know, the, the lawsuit was initially uh, brought by the low wealth, some mm -hmm. of the low wealth districts in the yeah. state. Well, the Charlotte Mecklenburg schools where people think, well, you've got all this resource. That's absolutely not the case. Mm. So then moved to uh, Guilford County Schools and actually appeared before Judge Manning, who was a judge, a trial court judge who mm. uh, supervised um, the litigation. And then with the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation, um, the Z. Smith Reynolds Foundation funded the low wealth plaintiffs. And then funded a report, an independent report that was um, commissioned that the court relied on to say that billions mm. of additional dollars are due into our public schools, billions. Um, and so at the same time then that the General Assembly says, we're going to now ratchet it up to a half a billion dollars going to private schools. And so when you break that down, now you begin to see Exactly what you said. This is a false choice. Mm -hmm. It's a false choice. Now, having said that, I want to speak to and on behalf of public schools. There are amazing things going on in our public schools. Mm. Um, and that is in spite of the fact that they're underfunded. In fact, um, you can go online and Google this is uh, information uh, that will clearly show that if you look at the demographics of our kids in North Carolina and make those sort of the same as in every other state, okay. our teachers and educators 
on what's called the nation's report card Mm -hmm. are actually putting our kids in the top tiers of how our kids are performing. Mm -hmm. Despite the fact that we are in the bottom tier in funding. Mm -hmm. So sit with that for a moment. I've told us that we are billions of dollars short of what's necessary. Yet our educators are doing these remarkable things with the little bit that they have. Mm. And so what happens, I think, is if we get on board with paying what we ought pay for our public schools, our educators will deliver. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me talk a little bit about um, what happens in Guilford County, just because I have some experience there. Um, and I want to lift up because, you know, oftentimes we think about who's at the bottom and who gets educated well, and it's often African-American males. Mm. Um, and in Guilford County, we had a school that, you know, at one point had about 41% of its kids performing on grade level mm. on end-of-course examinations. I had a brand-new principal. Go there, and I visited a school. He's written a book about this, so I'm just hmm. not making this up. He said, when I visited, I said, I don't see much going on here. And he said, Mo, um, in that book, he said, you know, we've got to really raise expectations because this superintendent is about excellence. Hmm. What that school did with much support from central office and others and parents and students and the educators in that building, took a school from there to having over 90% of the students performing on grade level mm. on the end of grade exams, had 100% graduation rates, mm. had 100% co- kids getting accepted to college. Wow. All male, almost 100% African-American male. And they did this not for one year and say, oh, wow, you got it done for... No, this is year after year after year. This can be done. Yeah. It's just a matter of, are we going to lean in to number one, excellence, or are we going to fund what we can to make excellence occur in each of our school buildings, not just those oasises, if you will, of where there are good things going on? That, that's a great story. Um, I got two I have a statement and a follow-up question for yeah. you on that. Because I one of my frustrations when I was in the General Assembly mode was that we did not fund what was working, to your point. Um, for me, the early college system is a good example of that. I've seen them be very successful. Yeah. Um, I've seen these innovative kind of schools that wind up in like, they start off low-performing status, but they give them the ability to innovate, the ability to be creative. I've seen it in Edgecombe County when Valerie Bridges was superintendent there and how they were making a turnaround. Yeah. So that's been a frustration for me because it's almost like there's there's not the will mm-hmm. in the General Assembly, um, at least currently, mm-hmm. um, to, to help uh, successful schools to be replicated and yeah. duplicated. But yeah. because I think you're right, I think they can be. What If you had to identify, though, using that school you were referencing in Guilford County, what, what were some of the things that made it, you think, so successful? Yeah. So, um, and first of all, Valerie Bridges was a principal in Guilford County Schools when I was superintendent. Oh, okay. Uh, and she was actually the principal for my son's school. Okay. So, um, strong supporter and believer in Valerie Bridges mm-hmm. and what she was able to do in Guilford and then what she was able to do when she became superintendent. There are um, some ingredients that I think are critically important um, for a school to become a school of excellence. Um, The first one, though, starts with expectations. You have got to set the bar exceedingly high. Mm -hmm. And so when I say um, that we want to be about excellence— yeah, because most people think, well, if we can just get a little incrementally better, mm-hmm. that's good. That's we are we are disadvantaging our kids mm-hmm. because our kids. When you set the expectation for the adults in the building at an exceedingly high level, mm-hmm. um, the kids will rise to that. Le- they're gonna they're gonna do whatever the adults allow for them to do and, yes, and follow. So that's one. 
Two, um, you've got to be willing to hire well mm. and be willing to say um, I, everyone gets a chance to rise to the level. I coach you up, but sometimes we're going to have to remove you out. Mm -hmm. Because if you're not about excellence, then this isn't going to be the school for you. Yep. Three, um, I think you have to be masters of your craft. And so um, educators um, are, in many instances, masters. Sometimes they get in situations where they, they, they don't sort of reveal that. Yeah. And so if you set the expectations high, you hire well, and then say, now, do what you do. Um, it can happen. Yeah. Um, you got to have funding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you see, I don't start off with funding. Right, right. Um, but funding is critically necessary for recruiting and retaining, uh, you know, the kind of staff that you want, providing the sort of resources necessary to have uh, kids get what they need, to provide the supports around kids, because some kids, quite honestly, are coming from situations that, you just don't walk in and say, okay, here's the class, here's the books, let's get to work. Right. They are dealing with community issues that require uh, a lot of additional support. Mm -hmm. We have to find the resources to provide those supports to those students. Yeah, those, and That's the good. principal at the school, um, Eric Hines, you know, he talks about his seven ingredients. Um, I've picked out a few that I okay. think, uh, you know, I think are critically important to that that level of success. So let me let me kind of challenge you a little bit on this. Mm -hmm. I sat, uh, when I was in the General Assembly, uh, Governor Cooper had a task force called the Drive Task Force, yeah. um, um, Representative Inclusive Vision for Education. I'm amazed. I was in, now I'm from Philadelphia, so I was educated in Philadelphia public schools, but I was in seventh grade before I had my first white teacher. Mm. I speak to many students now at my church. We have a huge K-12 population. Many of them are in middle school and have yet to see a black teacher. What are your thoughts about how we, how we create a more diverse environment and attract more African Americans, Latino Americans into our classrooms. Yes. So, um, first of all, this is a dire situation, I think, in North Carolina, as it is across the country, where um, many of our uh, school districts and schools are taught mostly by uh, whites and white women. And there's no disrespect to them, because I actually mm -hmm. think that many of them do a remarkable job uh, and try to understand um, the students who end up before them. Sure. Which in North Carolina is becoming increasingly, in fact, majority students of color. Right. We need more um, educators of color to be in our schools. There was a time that they were there, and we have systematically found ways to put them away. Um, and so my appeal would be, uh, there, there are any number of things that I think strategically one has to do and can do, but the first thing I think we have to do is recognizing that at this moment, North Carolina doesn't want to pay teachers what they ought be paid. Mm -hmm. And so I recognize and appreciate that those in black and brown folk who could make the choices of where they want to go mm -hmm. uh, to work are not going to choose schools. I need you to choose schools. Yeah. It's, 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 it's that. And then let's figure out together how we elevate the pay and the compensation. We'll work together to do that. But I need you first to say, I'm going to choose to be an educator. Yeah. Yeah, so one of the things that I have started trying to float is the following, and I think I, I floated it first. I'm, I want to float it first with uh, a focus on HBCUs, mm -hmm. uh, historically black uh, colleges and universities. That whatever um, degree you get, 
get a teacher license along with it. Hmm. Whatever you do, chemistry major, business major, whatever that happens to be, I want you to get a teacher license along with Good. that. Because what I think we'll start to do is we'll start to generate folk who will say, I'm willing to take that step. And maybe I'm only going to do it for a couple of years. And then, then I always tell folk, you give me a couple of years in our schools, and I'll get you for long. It, it's now mm-hmm. incumbent on me to figure out how I keep you there. Right. Um, as a superintendent or a leader of a school district or, you know, a principal. Sure. Um, so that's part of how, you know, so first I, I think we've got to have a mindset that says, okay, um, and so why am I, why am I saying, why am I going to do that? And I'm like, Mo, Mo I, I hear you, mm-hmm. but why? Our kids need you. I mean, I, I don't know how to say it any clearer. Our kids need you. Um, they need the kind of folk who are going to understand them well mm. and are not going to let them slip and slide. Yep. The best educators, so I had a different sort of growing up experience. I actually went to a private school when I was born and started going to school in New York. Okay. Um, and so I had all African American educators. Okay. And then move to Georgia, and then you're like, where can't find them okay. very often? Um, not that they weren't there. We definitely had some, but not to that same level. So I sort of had this sense early on of how magnificent it is to see folk who are look like me carrying on like they know what the heck they're doing. Yeah. Um, and are in pouring into you all that uh, uh, you need to be and do well and didn't let you slip and slide. Yeah, man. Look, I I, I won't do it on this show, but I have a story of how my sixth grade teacher saved my life. Yes. Um, And I I still am in contact with her to this day. Yes. And um, and so I know the value. And I had great parents at home, but they didn't understand the educational system. Yeah. You know, I grew up with my parents, but my parents would say to me, my dad, you would say, son, education is a type of salvation. Mm-hmm. It can get you to heaven, but it can sure make getting around earth a whole lot easier. There you go. And we kind of held on to that. So, yeah. listen, we got to wrap up. This is James Gale, and I'm in studio with Maurice Mo Green, who is running for superintendent of North Carolina Department of Public Instruction. Y'all, he is my guy. I'm excited about his candidacy. I, I'm hoping and praying and believing he's going to be our next state superintendent. Um, early voting starts on February 15th. Um, election day is March 5th. So we are, we're, the, we're winding down. Um, and it's not just his race. There's a whole bunch of other races that we need to care about. Mo, if people want to, if they want to support you, if they want to know more about your campaign, if they want to reach you, how do they do all that? And then I'm going to give you the last word for, for the audience. Excellent. Very good. So they reached me through uh, Mo Green, M O G R E E N. For f o r n c dot com. That's my website, and then on that you can find out more about me. You can find out how to contact me if you have questions that say, "Well, Mo, I ain't fully on board with you yet." You just put that. There's a place where you can. Uh, there's something that we call Mo wants to know hmm. on our website. This is something I did when I was superintendent of Guilford County Schools. Then when I was at Z Smith Reynolds Foundation, I listen first, I learn, and then I try to lead in the way that I try hmm. to lead. And so, if there's something that you like, well, Mo, I need to explore this with you. You put that right in there. Now, there are other things you can do. Um, you can certainly join the team. You can volunteer. And I'm learning <laughs> that to run and win statewide takes, takes money. money. Yes, sir. And so um, I also need those dollars to make this happen if you want Mo to be the next superintendent of uh, public instruction in North Carolina. Well, look, that's awesome. Th- thank you for running. Thank you for your willingness to run. Folks, y'all have heard him. Um, this is Maurice Mo Green, hoping to be our next state superintendent of public, edu- public instruction for the state of North Carolina. You know how to reach him. Remember, early voting starts February 15th, election day. 
It's March 5th. I need y'all to vote up and down that entire ballot. Don't leave a single spot un, unfilled in. I want you to fill in everything. And I want you to begin thinking about the value of public education. Listen, you may be listening to this and you may be 70 years old. And you're like, well, you know, my, my, my children are up and gone. But somebody's going to need to take care of you when you get to the hospital. Somebody's going to need to bring those groceries out to your car. Somebody's going to need to deliver something to your house. We all need uh, the workforce that comes out of our schools in North Carolina. And because our four-year college and two-year college system are so extraordinary, we need great feeder systems um, into those school systems. So, again, this is James Galliard here with Maurice Mo Green. Thank you for listening and watching In Black and White. We'll see you tomorrow. Thanks, Mo. Thank you.